research and what we teach and learn. Yeah, a very live issue right here, in fact, with the uh, Monk proposal for the Global Affairs uh, Institute. Yeah, it's a serious problem, but we have, have to remember that when you talk about a, a funding for the university, it's always coming from the outside. The universities do not produce commodities for sale. Okay, they don't make, they're not profit-making institutions, at least they shouldn't be. Uh, they're supposed to meet other goals, the ones that uh, Linda quoted from the uh, uh, very eloquent uh, statement of University of Toronto. Well, since you don't, since it's a parasitic institution by its nature, it's going to get funding or it won't survive. Well, in a decent society, it would just be a public obligation to uh, ensure the uh, healthy survival of institutions that uh, meet those fine ideals. Well, we don't, we're not a healthy society, so that doesn't happen, and therefore you have to look for other sources of funding. Um, it, 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 for a long time, go back not too far, say when I was a student, you know, not ancient history for me at least, uh, public education was free. So, uh, I mean, I happened to go to a private college, but you know, it costs almost nothing. I could, $100, actually, to get a scholarship. Uh, and uh, the public institutions were publicly funded. Now, since the 1970s, that's changed radically. By now, in the United States, uh, in most states, uh, more than half of the funding for the public universities is coming from tuition. Okay. Uh, now, what that does is impose a huge debt burden on students, and that has a function. It traps them. It's a mode of indoctrination and control. If you come out of college with a you know, $100,000 in debt, you're controlled. Uh, maybe you wanted to become a public interest lawyer, uh, but you're going to have no choice but to go to a corporate law firm. And once you go to a corporate law firm, you get absorbed in the culture, and you're off, it's off and running. And the same is true in everything else. So there is this, a technique of indoctrination and control that's been developed since the 70s, in part, I think in large part, in reaction to the activism of the 60s, which was too democratic, too free, you know, terrified elites. And there are all sorts of techniques of control that are being restored, and this is one of them. Well, that's... Uh, undermining public education, uh, funding coming from tuition, you know, it's not the way it's supposed to work. Also, it restricts it pretty much to the wealthy who, who can pay it. Uh, the, uh, 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 what about corporate funding? Well, you know, corporate funding, like, say, the Monk Foundation, has its problems, serious problems. Uh, is it going to affect academic programs and uh, research and so on? Uh, if it is, I think it should be resisted. And there are plenty of ways to resist it. In fact, some of them Linda mentioned. In the case of, say, the monk gift, it's, a, you know, the, it's, it's coming from gold mining. Uh, mining altogether is a total international scandal. Most of it's coming from Canada, and it has horrifying effects all over the world, uh, destroying uh, communities, uh, destroying the environment. And gold mining is the worst, apart from which Barrick Gold has its own very credible human rights, uh, charge of human rights violations. Well, that's a proper topic, I think Linda mentioned this, for a uh, Institute of Global Affairs in, in a Canadian university, particularly one fun funded by the criminals. A proper topic is, uh, uh, what are they doing? You know, And that's not just academic. Uh, the people who are being harmed by these practices have no voice uh, but people here have a voice and can help protect them and people do there are solidarity groups uh, my daughter for example works in one that, uh, that work on these issues I've been involved too well you know a university program is a perfect place for that and this would be a fine place to do it it's not outlandish I talked about this a little bit yesterday, but just in my own institution, um, I happened to be in a, for a long time, was a Pentagon-funded university, almost totally funded by the Pentagon. It was also the center of anti-war resistance 
I don't mean protest, I mean resistance, real resistance. So a number of us were facing prison terms and so on. Well, that was taking place under 100% Pentagon funding. It can be done, you know, uh, and uh, a lot of latitude. But uh, the idea, the fact that there's going to be external funding is essentially inescapable. If the society does not recognize it as just an obligation to sustain free and independent institutions, well, it's just going to have to come from somewhere else. All right, so we'll take two questions to my left, and then we'll look into the overflow rooms. Um, Mr. Chomsky, first of all, uh, uh, it's my pleasure to see you in person. Um, as you know, uh, some South American countries like Bolivia, Venezuela, and Ecuador are moving towards a more democratic and just society, and that alone creates enemies. Um, powerful corporations and countries related to them uh, try to discredit them. In turn, they uh, try to have uh, alliances with different countries and progressive people in the world. What concerns me is that uh, when these South American countries uh, get close to uh, countries with history of human rights abuse and brutal dictatorship, uh, wouldn't that partly negate their purpose of creating support, especially amongst the people under repression and also progressive people in the world? Yeah, I, I understood most, but not the last part. Did you could, you, could you repeat the last part? Uh, what I mean is that uh, when, they get, when they get close to countries... When who gets close? Uh, the South American countries, yeah. like Venezuela, yeah, uh, yeah. Bolivia. When they get close to countries that have history of human rights abuse yeah. and uh, also uh, brutal dictatorship. What do you mean get close to? Uh, politically. What? Uh, economically, politically... So they, like if Venezuela gets close to Iran, for exactly. example? Exactly. Yeah, okay. So uh, wouldn't that negate the fact that uh, uh, the people that are in those countries under repression, uh, they, they wouldn't be able to uh, support the countries that... Uh, so we, people in Iran would exactly. not support Chavez, mm -hmm. exactly. let's say. Exactly. Yeah, I suppose so. But... Uh, what am I supposed to do about that? <laughs> but, uh, I meant, I meant uh, what is your opinion in regards to uh, this kind of a, uh, uh, you know, uh, Should problem? Uh, let's take, say, Brazil. Uh, Chavez is everybody's whipping boy, so let's put that aside. If he says two words, you have to attack it. So let's take Brazil, uh, the most admired country in the South. Uh, the most uh, popular political leader you know, in the modern world, Lula. Uh, they were very, he, uh, Lula was very supportive of Iran. Okay. Uh, the United States was furious. In fact, uh, Brazil and Turkey, you know, the major reg regional power, infuriated the United States by working out a deal with Iran to handle the pro problem of uh, the production of uh, fissile materials. The, it was kind of interesting that Obama had favored that. In fact, the United States immediately denounced it, but as soon as they did, the Brazilian foreign ministry released, released a, a letter from Obama to the president uh, urging him to proceed with this. Now, the reason surely was that Obama assumed it would fail and then it could be a weapon to beat the Iranians over the head with. Uh, when it succeeded, they were furious and they immediately rammed through an almost meaningless uh, UN resolution to try to undercut it. But it's true that Brazil was uh, uh, supportive of Iran in this respect. It uh, tried to, along with Turkey, major regional power, it, uh, tried to find a way to get out of this crisis. Uh, both Iran and uh, Brazil and Turkey, incidentally, are increasing uh, economic relations with Iran. So Turkey, for example, is... Uh, announced at around the same time that it's tripling trade. They opened a pipeline to Iran. Now they're trying to integrate Iran into some sort of a regional system. Well, okay, I mean, we can decide whether we like that or not, but uh, I mean, I, I don't see the problem with it. I'm in favor of it. I think that, I'm sorry, I think they ought to be doing that. Uh, 
so I'm not sure I understand what the problem is. What about the Iranian people? Should the Iranian people, should the Iranian people support the fact that uh, Turkey and Brazil are trying to find a resolution for the nuclear issue and increasing trade? I suspect they probably do support that. They remember that on, you're Iranian? Yeah, so you know better than I do that uh, in Iran, there's overwhelming support for the nuclear energy program. Almost everybody supports it. So if somebody's finding a way to get around the uh, conflict, I imagine they'd think that's fine. They don't want to be bombed. Uh, as for increasing trade, well, you know, you have to ask them, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's a popular move. On the other hand, if it's supporting the repression, that's a different story. But I don't think uh, Brazil or Turkey is doing that. Actually, you might ask, we might ask ourselves why we're, while we're on this, what's the issue about Iran? Okay, uh, it's a big issue. I mean, that is the issue, the leading issue in U.S. foreign policy. The leading issue is the Iranian threat. Now that's this is called the year of Iran. We've got to deal with the Iranian threat. Everybody's hysterical about it. And one thing you don't see discussed is what is the Iranian threat. Okay, try to find a discussion of that. Actually, we have an authoritative answer to that question. It's just not reported. The authoritative answer comes from the Pentagon and from U.S. intelligence. Can't get higher than that. Uh, every year, the Pentagon and the intelligence system provide a, uh, an analysis to Congress of the global security situation. Uh, and the last one, uh, of course, spent a lot of time on Iran. And here's what it said. You know, don't take my word for it. Look it up. You can find it on the internet. Uh, what they said is there's no military threat. They said Iran has very low military expenditures, even by the standards of the region. Uh, its uh, military strategy is to, is defensive. It's to try to uh, protect the country against an invasion and delay an invasion long enough so that diplomacy can set in. Uh, they said they have almost no capacity to deploy force. In fact, uh, General Petraeus, you know, head of the Central Command not long ago, said something, something like, he said that the uh, Qatari Air Force could take out the Iranian Air Force in 15 minutes or something. But uh, so they're not, and they said if they're developing nuclear weapons, which they don't know, it would be part of the deterrent strategy. And if any country needs a deterrent strategy, it's Iran. It's completely surrounded by hostile military forces of an of a aggressive, brutal superpower, totally surrounded. Countries next to it are occupied. And the United States and its allies are constantly threatening an attack, which happens to be in violation of the UN Charter, if anybody cares, and in violation of specific Security Council resolutions, which ask the countries not to do that. They're polite enough not to mention the countries that are doing it. And so yeah, they need a deterrent. In fact, one of Israel's leading uh, military historians, Martin von Krefeld, after the, he doesn't want Iran to have nuclear weapons, but after the invasion of Iraq, he wrote that if Iran is, we've just seen that the US and Britain attacked Iraq for no reason at all. And if Iran is not developing nuclear weapons, they're crazy. Uh, that was just straight description. Well, I don't want them to have nuclear weapons, even though most of the Arab world does. Uh, but it, it's not, whatever it is, it's not a military threat. And, and then, in fact, the uh, intelligence of the Pentagon go on to describe the actual threat. And it's interesting reading. It tells us a lot about ourselves. The threat is that Iran is trying to extend its influence into neighboring countries. So it's trying to extend its influence into Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, that, there's a word for that. It's called destabilization. They're trying to destabilize the neighboring countries. When we invade and occupy and destroy those countries, that's called stabilization. <laughs> I'm not joking. I'm not joking. And they're trying to destabilize them by expanding their influence. Well, you know, obviously, that's totally illegitimate. We can't accept that. That's the threat. Now, the Iranian government is a threat. It's a terrible threat to its own population. Uh, I'm afraid it's not unique in that respect. Uh, same is true of 
a number of our closest allies. Uh, but that's a threat, all right. Uh, however, what's called the Iranian threat is, uh, is not that. And people ought to understand it. This is the major issue in foreign policy now. So at least understand what it is. You know. I think he's back. Hi, Professor Chomsky. Um, I was actually going to ask about the Goldstone report, but that got tackled right off the bat. So um, forgive me if this question is a little improvised. But um, um, right after 9-11, um, you and Christopher Hitchens had a sort of dispute in the nation. And, um, you know, he sort of accused you of being an apologist for Islamic fundamentalism. And you accused him of you know, um, using these horrible acts to justify U.S. foreign policy. Um, but my focus is um, more his um, um, Hitchin staunch secularism and um, those of other um, so-called new atheists like Sam Harris who seem to have the staunch secularism, which I personally agree with, but use it to justify, um, you know, an aggressive foreign policy. So... I'm just thinking of how to word this as a question. Um, do you see a way to rec not reconcile? Do you see a way to um, sort of um, uh, separate the um, staunch secularism of um, Harris and Hitchens from their uh, warmongering and, uh, in Harris's case, outright support for torture? Mm -hmm. Well, there are. Maybe I can take that. Yeah. If I understood you, it's actually... No? No? What's going on? This is okay? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, well, there are two questions, if I understood it. One is about the claim that I was justifying 9-11. Oh, no, that was... No. Well, why did, you, why did you bring up Hitchens? Well, because he's one of those atheists. What? Well, can I, can I skip the first part of the question? Because it's just a total fabrication, and there's no point wasting time on it. But uh, the second part, what about the secularism? Well, first of all, I, don't, I think that they are religious fanatics. They happen to believe in the state religion, which is much more dangerous than uh, other religions for the most part. So they, uh, both of them, happen to be defenders of the state religion, uh, namely the religion that says... Uh, we have to support the uh, violence and atrocities of our own state uh, because it's being done for all sorts of wonderful reasons, uh, which is exactly what everyone says in every state. And I, I don't regard, uh, that's just another religion, like the religion that markets know best. I mean, it doesn't happen to be a religion that you pray to every um, once a week, but it's just another religion and it's very destructive. Okay, so I'd like to uh, see if there's any questions in the East Common Room first. Are there any questions in the East Common Room? Yeah, one moment. So, well, we have enough time to take one question for each overflow room. You just talk. Okay. Um, my question is a little bit separate from the topics of today. It relates to your work on linguistics. Uh, so, originally, um, when you attacked Skinner's behaviorist model of language acquisition, you did it on the basis that the poverty of stimulus required that we had some prior faculty in our mind that allowed us to learn language from limited examples. Do you think there's a similar argument or account of a common human morality can be given? And do you have such an account or you have an idea of what such an account would look like. Just to uh, respond, if, if you look at that, as far as the review of Skinner was concerned, uh, almost 95% of it was just running through claims that he was making and arguing that these are totally absurd based on nothing. I mean, I did at the very end of the review say, look, there's another way of looking at this, which comes out of mainstream biology. Uh, mainstream biology just takes for granted that every capacity, you know, your visual system, your ability to walk, uh, whatever it may be, is based on some genetic uh, property. I mean, that's not even discussed. And that's in linguistics, it happens to be called poverty of stimulus, but it's universal. 
what it means is that the kind of creature you are is not determined by the inputs. Like you can't change a human embryo into a cat embryo by changing around the nutrition in the, in the uh, uterus, you know. It's going to become a human being, you know. That's because it's built that way. Uh, that's just a biological truism. And it's presumably no reason to doubt that it's also true of language. I think it is. Uh, what about morality? Well, I think it's the same thing. Actually, that was pointed out by David Hume. He's, he is, you know, the leading empiricist, but there's a lot of confusion about what empiricism is. The empiricists like Locke and Hume and others, uh, contrary to illusions, they believed in innate structure. And the reason is they were not idiots. I mean, of course, everything that happens comes out of innate, in a large part, out of innate structure. Well, what about morality? Uh, Hume couldn't give much of a proof, but he said, uh, he just made some observations, which are correct. He said, uh, look, we're constantly making moral decisions in new situations. And they're pretty consistent, and other people pretty much comprehend them and so on. Well, if we're doing that, it must be that we have some principles that are lying behind it. And the principles can't be picked up by induction. In fact, in, fact, in his view, nothing can. It's all what he called animal instinct. It's coming from animal instinct. That's what's now called genetic endowment. So genetic endowment is determining our capacity to gain uh, knowledge, understanding, uh, develop moral principles, and so on and so forth. And I think that's probably, I don't see how that can be false. Well, the next problem is to try to go on and find out what they are. Uh, well, there's plenty of work on that. That's in fact a large part of the content of the classical moral philosophy. And it's picked up again in modern work, for example, uh, John Rawls's famous theory of justice, probably the most influential uh, work in political science, you know, political philosophy in the last century. He, uh, that's what he does. In fact, he picks a linguistic model. If you look, he says it's, uh, our concept of justice, that part of morality, uh, has to be just like our acquisition of language. And then he discusses parallels, and based then he tries to show what the, the principles would be. You know kind of original condition type thing, what, what they would be. All right, you can say you got it right or you got it wrong, but that's the program. And I don't see what other program there could be. Now, there is more contemporary work, recent work uh, proceeding further with this. There's even empirical studies by now of uh, uh, children's moral judgment, uh, comparative moral judgments in different societies, and uh, uh, some theoretical structure about uh, what might lie behind them? Well, yeah, that's uh, empirical inquiry into the nature of, uh, into what our moral nature is. But that it must be there, I think, is pretty obvious, even from Hume's comments. Okay, great. So we'll take one question from the debates room. One second, please. Yeah. Uh, hello, Mr. Chomsky. Uh, I'd just like to thank you, first of all, for coming and for answering more questions than Stephen Harper seems to be answering on his, uh, on his uh, election cycle. Um, I'd just like to ask, uh, you've uh, discussed a lot, of, uh, the title of your talk today was The uh, State Corporate Complex. You've made your views pretty clear in the long term that you think that a libertarian socialist solution is a practical one for uh, society. You've called it a natural extension of classical liberalism. In the short term, what do you see um, in involving the usefulness of, uh, of uh, programs like uh, campaign finance reform and uh, things of that nature, simply for the short term? In the short term, what is the use of things like finance reform, for example? That's right. Yeah. Well, you know, in the short term, it, uh, it was not a very far-reaching proposal that we should go back to something that's worked very well in the past. Uh, finance regulation, say, of the New Deal type, was very successful. There were no financial crises. The financial crises are pretty devastating. Uh, plenty of people suffer from them, and they're going to get worse. You know. So yes, uh, regulatory reform, uh, the kind that, for example, Folker was advocating, that's why he was thrown out, uh, and others, sure, they uh, make perfectly good sense. 
I mean, the, there was a bill that came out of the Senate, the Dodd-Frank bill, which, if it were implemented, it would probably have some dampening effect on crises. It's getting chipped away at by lobbyists, so what's going to be left is probably nothing. But uh, uh, sure, it would, it would make perfectly good sense, just like uh, the reasonable um, health reform would make good sense. For example, in the United States, again, it's not a particularly dramatic proposal, but if the United States had a health care system like every other industrial society, uh, there wouldn't be any deficit. In fact, there'd be a surplus. Well, that's important because uh, the deficit is being used to uh, cut away at extremely useful programs. Uh, furthermore, the fact that there are 50 million people uninsured and that health care is pretty much rationed by wealth, uh, that has all kind of uh, horrible consequences. So sure, nothing wrong with reforms. There's a lot of simple reforms that could be made. I mean, I think we can go way beyond them, but just very simple, straightforward reforms could make a much better world. I don't know if I got the question correctly, but yeah. yeah? Okay, so we are going over time, so we're, we're, we're pretty much towards the end. We have time for one more question, so we'll take it from, you know, go ahead. Yeah, is that good? Mic check. Uh, Dr. Chomsky, it was always a little odd to me that you don't identify as a semiotician, and I was just wondering maybe if you could talk about the field of semiotics, uh, what you see, if there's a future for that in academia, maybe what your experience is. You better come. He wants you to talk about the uh, field of semiotics. Semiotics? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those, remember when Goering was supposedly asked what he thought about culture, he said he reaches for his revolver. But uh, it's not quite that bad. But I, I don't know what it is. I mean, it's the general theory of everything symbolic and use of science. It's, uh, I think that's too broad to be a real field. But there are particular aspects of it that are interesting, like linguistics, or like animal communication, or like uh, the visual arts and so on. Whether there's anything unifying to say about those, well, if there is, fine, you know, be in favor of it. But a lot of the work that's being done, at least in my judgment, looks pretty shallow. And uh, but draw your own conclusions. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> it's a pleasure to see you again. Yeah. And uh, it, and uh, thank you for what you brought us this afternoon. You know. Uh, I uh, had the pleasure of uh, uh, presenting Noam Chomsky at a Hart House meeting against the Vietnam War in 1966. <laughs> 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 it's, it's, it's really nice to see him still rolling along, eh? Uh, now, uh, I, I, Hart House uh, has contributed a huge amount to the possibility of this meeting. Uh, the, uh, many of the volunteers and the central organization. And uh, I, I want to point out uh, another aspect of history. That Hart House is represented here by uh, Louise Cowan, the warden, um, uh, by uh, Linda McQuaig. Did you know that she was an undergraduate uh, debater in the Hart House Debates Committee? and by Semra Sevi, who uh, 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 pulled all of this together, who uh, did a lot of the chairing here this afternoon, all of whom would have been forbidden prior to 1970, because under the bequest, it was an all-male institution. And uh, I, I think it's, uh, we didn't plan it this way, but it's, uh, it's a happy coincidence that three women uh, uh, are the face of Hart House this afternoon. Um, and I, I also uh, want to thank all the others who helped us out. Uh, Bev Stoll uh, in uh, Massachusetts uh, planning uh, Norm's trip, and uh, our many volunteers, and the two organizations, uh, uh, Science for Peace, of which uh, I'm a representative, and. Near East Cultural and Educational Foundation, of which I'm also a member, 
uh, and our material is outside. Uh, I urge you to take a look at it, not only because we were good hosts, uh, which I hope we were, but because, as Professor Chomsky reminds us of the ch challenges and opportunities of the present, which our masters in corporations and government refuse to face or to tell the truth about, uh, we must take their place, we must find the truth and act on it, and I invite you all to come forward with us in this. Thank you.